From the creepy swamps deep in the heart of Cajun country, I welcome you to Fave Five from Fans, the podcast where I, Jamie Ray, your humble host, invite a friend of mine to create a list of five of their favorite things that we have a shared interest in, be it movies, books, TVs, toys, or really whatever. Next, we sit down to compare and contrast, dissect and disseminate our choices for you, the listening audience. We'll start off with honorable mentions, those selections that just didn't make the Fave Five, and then trade off our choices backwards from five, four, three, two, and finally number one. All that's left is for you to decide who's right, who's wrong, and will we still be friends after all this? You may be asking yourself, hey, who is this guy? Well, I'm a dad, a husband, a son, and a brother, among other things. I'm into Star Trek, Rom the Space Knight, zombies, and cheese, though not necessarily in that order. I'm an avid fan of movies, all kinds of movies, but I'm especially rabid about horror films. I'm also a longtime Trekkie, still going strong. As a Trekkie, I made some close friends, and we travel all around to Star Trek conventions. That made for a lot of windshield time and a lot of what's your favorite conversations. I hope that this podcast can capture some of that fan fervor we had, but this time with a different guest and a different topic each episode. We'll be discussing everything from alien invasions to zombie attacks, from war movies to musical numbers, Edgar Allan Poe to Stephen King, both literary and adaptations. I can't wait to get started, so please sit back, strap in, and get ready for this episode of Fave Five from Fans. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Fave Five from Fans. Normally, in this part, we're going to sit here and talk about a list of our favorite five something or another's. But today, I've invited two of my past guests, Lo Chang and Wilbur Augustus, Super Gus. And we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about our favorite movie experiences. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, we're not really sure yet. We're going to figure it out as we go along. But basically, we'd like to talk about some of our movie experiences, whether we were in a theater or sitting at home or... Just when we saw something. And so I'd like to go ahead and um, say hello first to our two guests. Uh, Super Gus, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, and hello. Thanks for having me back. Mr. Lo on the red mic. That's the whole joke. It's not very <laughs> fun. <laughs> so guys, uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, Gus. Oh, wow. There's not much to tell. Um, well, you I'm, like long walks on the beach. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'm the original sci-fi nerd. I love me some science fiction. Um, I'm talking about classic, new, remake. You know, I, I've watched the original Battlestar Galactica, the, the reimagining. Uh, let's see. Star Trek. Original, Next Generation. Star Wars. Oh, let me some Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> you said something very interesting uh, just to the, earlier today at lunch about the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars. Yeah. For me, the distinction is that Star Trek is science fiction, mm -hmm. while Star Wars is science fantasy. Wow. Star Trek, you know... They explain now. I'm not saying that all of their explanations are really based in reality, mm -hmm. but there's science behind it. Right, right. And Star Wars, basically, they present to you a piece of technology, and you know they tell you it works. Right. That's all you need to know. True, true. You know, it's just like I was watching a recent episode of Mandalorian, and I was like, you know what? How do they make these ships fly? What you know? What gas or what powers them? I had that thought um, watching a similar episode. As they got off the speeder bikes, they just kind of hovered. They didn't move. They just kind of rocked. And I thought to myself, "It's not anti-grav. Maybe it is anti-grav. Is there an, some sort of anti-grav tether? I mean, what's holding <laughs> it there? And what makes it so that when you hit the accelerator, 
it moves forward, but there's no visible engine, there's no movement power. And we, we just accept that. Just it's exactly what you just said. No, I think it's, a, it's a I think it's a valid uh, uh, depiction because look, with this, with the Star Wars, we just accept that it's a universe long, long ago, galaxy far, far away, and just that they have this technology. I was just a little kid. I always wondered how does the lightsaber work. I mean, you have this pole of laser. What makes it stop? Why exactly. doesn't it just extend? Exactly. But we just accept that it's. Oh, by the way, Mr. Sci-Fi Nerd, I'm, I'm well, probably your devil's advocate for Sci-Fi Nerd. <laughs> the reason the, uh, the lightsabers don't go on forever is because they bend and uh, focus back on themselves. I actually read that years and years and years okay. ago. You realize that what you said makes absolutely no sense. Well, I thought Because the lightsabers make sense. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> I thought it was because the crystal eventually burns out. Isn't that what makes the color of the lightsaber is what color crystal it has and the aura of the Jedi? The different colors represent different crystals. Uh, apparently, as they are stripped of their energy and corrupted is what causes them to go red. Oh, okay. okay. So. so I know the purple one means you are bad mother. Shut my mouth. Okay, never mind. You don't get the <laughs> reference. I do. <laughs> I got the reference. I just was trying to go from Star Wars... <laughs> To Tarantino, Tarantino <laughs> to Shaft. So, Lo, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started. Well, uh, like us, I am somewhat of a nerd, a science geek. Uh, uh, I also like to cook, but I like to uh, play. Like I said, Devil's Advocate to a lot of Gus. We have a lot of mm-hmm. uh, uh, we have a lot of discussions and go back and forth a lot of, about a lot of these uh, sci-fi movies and science fantasy movies, and uh, we don't always agree. We actually most of the time don't seem to agree. <laughs> Key point. Uh-huh. We were once having a conversation about Star Trek, and we were talking about how come a Klingon bird of prey does not have two warp engines, one to power the weapons, and one to power the cloak. Seems really simple. Could it be that the two warp bubbles would uh, counteract each other? But no, they're not at warp. They're ju- you're just getting the power from them. Mm-hmm. Why? An uh, undiscovered country? That would be Star Trek Six. I right. discovered that. Yes, that um, that was a special Klingon bird of prey. It had two warp That's cores. right. That's right. Why don't they just make that standard? Well, I guess because maybe the um, when Chang died, he's the only one who knew how to fix it. Not you, Lo. General <laughs> Chang. Correct. <laughs> but yeah, just to kind of foil we are to each other. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, I would like to um, to invite you uh, listeners out there to sit down, and we'll bring you some of our favorite movies, and maybe you guys can come back and tell us in your comments one of your favorite movies. So, Super Gus, I'll kick it off to you. Would you like to start first? Yes, I would. Okay, this is not a favorite memory. If anything, this is the worst movie. Oh, ever. God, we're starting off on a bad note. <laughs> but it's my only one. Okay. And I only mention it because it was really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Me and Jennifer, Mrs. Chang. My wife. Had gone to see a Marlon Wayans movie, um, A Haunted House. Okay. Someone argue that was your first mistake. <laughs> Okay, I won't even go there. (laughs) But needless to say, it was a Marlon Wayans movie, so it was uh, rated R. Okay. So, you know, we we knew that going in. So we're in the movie theaters. The movie's actually starting. The previews are running. This couple and their friend comes in with three small children. To an R-rated movie. Yeah. So I'm like, at first I didn't think anything about it because, you know, I didn't really know what was in the movie or not. Maybe... I'm thinking maybe some adult language and whatnot, but, you know, nothing too bad. Well, needless to say, there is a scene in the movie where a woman is having sexual relations with several men. Okay. (laughs) One of the men who is, I guess, first in line is basically buck naked, and you see him, for lack of a better word, fornicating. Okay. (laughs) And just for you listeners, he is making all sorts of hand gestures at this point that you can't see. Well, don't forget that there are three young children right behind me and Jennifer. Right. And they're laughing at this one. Oh, my gosh. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is so uncomfortable. It was like if if my mother had brought me and my brother to that movie, not realizing what was in it, and she saw that, she would have grabbed both of our hands and she would have walked us out. (sighs) No. 
they're just watching and they're just giggling and I'm like, oh my god, wow. please let this movie be over soon. <laughs> But that was my most uncomfortable movie experience. Okay. Okay. So on that note, I'm actually going to uh, add a bad movie experience to this. All right. Um, this was many, many years ago. What I actually think might be one of the first mm, arguably good uh, video game movie adaptations. Mm -hmm. I went and saw Mortal Kombat, the okay. original one. Finish him. And <laughs> at the time, there wasn't, I think... Batman had been released to relatively good reviews, but the video game genre had not been uh, had really not been explored. And so Super Mario Brothers was not out yet. <laughs> even if it did, if even it was, I don't think I'd count it. But they did a decent job with Mortal Kombat. There was a lot of advertising hype. They had like the right soundtrack. It was very very techno at the time. And I went to at the time it was unheard of. It was midnight showing on like a Wednesday or something, right? And we're talking. What we'll looked it up? It's like mid '80s. So this is Chicago. 80s. Yeah, it was the okay. suburb of Chicago. That movie theater was packed. I mean, there was every seat was filled. We had people uh, sitting in the aisles, in the hallway, spilling out into the back, into the, uh, out of the back doors, and it was just jam packed. And if you haven't seen the movie, it is very, very techno music heavy. Okay. Opening credits go, and it's. Just got the music going, and maybe Jimmy can find the audio clip and put in the the, the, the music soundtrack. I'll do it right here. <laughs> it has begun. You get it, my dummy Shen? I don't need to run. And about two minutes into the movie, the big, giant bass speaker on the left-hand side of the house, which is where I was sitting, blows. Wow. I had paid uh, Chicago prices, you know, $10, $9 uh, wow. to get into this theater <laughs> at midnight, and my ride was there, and I didn't have any other way to get home. I sat through and watched that entire movie listening to... <laughs> throughout the entire movie didn't, see, didn't hear a single word that's I had to go see it again just to see the movie that's so fun <laughs> but I still remember it that is it that is it that is it but to be fair the movie was actually done well for that time right right but is, does it still hold up I think if you're a fan of the of the video game series, yeah, the first one does do pretty good. I mean, they don't follow the story exactly, but it's still a pretty good one. The, the sequels, no, not so it's much. It's no Street Fighter, right? With John claude Van Damme. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Raul about that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that bad. It, it's it's much better than that. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Never seen it, so I'd have to I'd have to to watch that one. Just Mortal Kombat. I don't think I would rewatch Street Fighter. So. Well, I guess I'll have to throw one in. Um, probably one of the worst movie experiences I ever had. Whew. It's got to be watching Bridges of Madison County. <laughs> okay. Okay, so anybody else want to move on? <laughs> Wait, you're not going to expound on that? That's enough. I had to watch Bridges of Madison County. What more could I have to say? Let me guess. <laughs> Tina forced you Tina. to go. Now... If she were here, this is the point where she'd say, well, yeah, I got three words for you. Lawnmower, man, two. <laughs> oh, they made a second one? They did. And she has forever got a pass card <laughs> for having to go see a horror movie because she sat through that. God love her. That was a horrible film. Oh, the first one wasn't that great. I actually enjoyed the first one just because it was different. You know, well, and Jeff Fahey, he, I was all about Jeff Fahey. It was um, It was supposed to be based on Stephen King's book, but it had nothing, nothing to, to do, do with, with his I, book. I agree. I agree. It was in name only. And as a matter of fact, I talk about that in one of my Fahey 5 Stephen King adaptation <clears throat> podcasts. Didn't you seem to get his name, try to get his name off of it? Oh, that's a good one. I'm going to look into that. I, I don't know that he did. But uh, I know that his name is still on it. And mm. So he probably lost that one. <laughs> All right, well, let's switch up and let's talk about some good movie experiences. Lord knows we all like to watch the cinema. 
So there's got to be some good ones. Um, Lo, let's jump back over to you. you. What's one of your favorite? So going back to the geekdom Star Wars, um, I spent a short period of time working part-time in a movie theater. Uh-huh. And most of the movie theaters have the perks where the employees get to watch movies. Okay. In this particular, it's a relatively larger chain. I won't mention anything because I'm not sure what type of legal ramifications you have. But uh, we got in... Uh, I want to say four prints of episode two, Star okay. Wars. And the chain that I work for pre-screens the movies. They always test the prints yes. to make sure they're, that they're working fine. So several of us were certified screeners, and we got to watch these movies before they released. So when episode two came out, I got to watch that movie like two days before. And they ended up just replaying for employees to minimize uh, traffic uh-huh. They played it in, in one of the back houses. We shut the theater down, so it was a small, like, 80-person movie. And we just played it re- on repeat over and over again for two days prior to the release. So in my fanboy moment, I got to sit and watch Yoda light his lightsaber <sighs> repeatedly for, like, two days straight <laughs> over and over again because that, honestly, is probably the finest, most redeeming aspect of that movie, <laughs> yeah. in my opinion. But it was a great series of days. We got to watch... You know, and, and the movie house that I worked for <clears throat> played the other th- episodes four, five, and six, as well as episode one leading up to it. So you could, you know, the concept was you could buy a ticket and a, a season pass sort of thing and go through over the weekend and watch all the movies together. So we just kept watching all the different movies and oh. we like looked down our time. Oh, it's Yoda's time. And we'd walk over, <laughs> pop, watch it, and go back and watch whatever the movie we were watching. That's so it was, great. It was, a, it was a great experience. I really loved it. So I want to say, I remember you telling me a story once uh, when you were working at this theater about... A, oh, I have lots of stories from when yeah, I was working at the theater. The power goes out and you have to <clears throat> jump from screen to screen. So <clears throat> one of the ways that some theaters will quote-unquote save money, because they have to pay for a print. A movie. So if they think it's going to be a popular movie, they will, as the film is feeding through the projector, they will feed it through various hanging hinges and feed it into another movie projector oh, on right. the other side of the building okay. or a, a, you know, on a house opposite or something. So on this particular night, it was opening of, I want to say it was Pearl Harbor. Okay. okay. And we only had, the theater I worked for had two prints. And we had it in our four largest houses because it was doing very well. So we had two prints in a house and then threaded across the ceiling to the house behind it to put in. So we had four showings. Well, I want to say it was like 40, 45 minutes in. We had a very, 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 very bad thunderstorm come through, pop the circuit, burned out the breaker. The theater went dark for 20 seconds before the ba- uh, the backup generators kicked in. But the problem is... As I found out that day, the backup generators don't power the projector motors. Mm -hmm. So the lights came on, promptly burning a hole through both prints. And there were three managers. It was like the last showing of the night. So there was three managers in the building, um, or two managers and a projectionist. The head manager, who also had projection experience, went upstairs to splice and repair mid-air, ceiling height, one print. The projectionist went up and did the other one. I, as the sacrificial lamb, got sent into the lobby to intercept the <laughs> throng of <laughs> unhappy customers with their dates coming out asking for refunds. Each one of those houses had 289 seats. Wow. So I was dealing with... Roughly 1,200 people. All coming out, trying to mad. get refund, complaining, yelling, mad, upset. Literally was, by yourself. Literally by myself. Wow. That was not a fun time. No. No. Wow. That should have been on the first first subject of bad experiences. (laughs) So, um, well, great. great. Gus, how about you? Do you have a favorite uh, or one of your favorites? Yes. One of my favorites was when I was way younger. I think, I don't think I was 10 yet. Um, This is when I lived in Oklahoma. That's when uh, they still had drive-in movie theaters. Oh, it's funny. My, one of mine's... I'm sorry. Go right ahead. <laughs> so, you know, my parents didn't take me and my brother to movies often. So, um, I remember they wanted to go see something. I don't even remember what it was. But I remember that uh, because they thought we were going to get home late, you know, me and my brother put on our pajamas. 
So as soon as we got back home, we could just go straight to bed. Makes sense. Well, you know, that was just the highlight of my year, I guess, because we were outside traveling in our pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we actually get to the movie theaters. It, it was just like, you know, it was it was a fun time. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I don't remember what we saw, but I just remember, you know, being at the mo- movies in my pajamas. That's great. So it was just, you know... So it's it's funny that you say that because uh, and if you're if you're finished, I am. Um, one of my favorite movies uh, experiences also takes place at a drive-in theater. Um, when I was a kid, we had a station wagon. So did and, we? Yeah. <laughs> and we went to the drive-in theater. I and, only had a rickshaw. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> we um, went to go see Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. And I remember it so well. It was at the Showtown Drive-In in Alexandria, um, which is actually still has both screens up. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's overgrown. The one of the projection booths is still there. But anyway, at this time, it was the first Friday after it opened, and so we go. My mom, my dad, my brother, and I, and we go out there to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. John and I get a couple of lawn chairs, and this is the old aluminum <laughs> lawn chairs. With the, and we get we sit up on top of the station wagon and watch Raiders of the Lost Ark in that full. I can remember as a kid with that big boulder started rolling down to it. I mean, that thing must have been it was like three or four stories tall. But that was such a fun night. I actually, um, before my father passed away, he and I went out there. And um, we didn't hop a fence, but we <laughs> drove through. And uh, there were a bunch of tiles that had fallen off uh, the screens and were on the ground. Mm-hmm. And I picked a couple of them up. And uh, I then went back and researched and found the exact date that that movie had played by going and looking through old microfiche copies of the newspapers and was able to print that newspaper out. So I actually... And I don't have it here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna plug it in <laughs> in post production. <laughs> I know the exact date of that memory, and uh, I have a copy of the newspaper article printed out. So mm. it's a really cool memory, you know. <laughs> it's it's really great to be able to to, to look back at that. And I have a th- little three D um, shadow box that has a copy of the article, and it has some other. And then I have one of the speakers mm. that they did from a um, you could buy. I'm, I don't know they were shut down, so. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a really great story. I loved it. So. <laughs> not to mention, not a bad movie either. No, yeah, it was a great movie. But that guy, I don't know, Han Solo was in it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. He hates scorpions or something. I don't remember what it was. But it was, it was a great movie. <laughs> um, so, all right, who's next? Jump, jump up. I'll go next. Okay. Okay. My next choice is basically good movie experience bad movie experience. Oh, okay. But only because it's a sequel. The first one it was for Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay. Yeah, you are you really you like those Tolkien stuff, huh? You know, the fantasy The guy. books, yes. I'm sorry, the movies, yes. The books, not so much so. Oh, okay. Gosh. I mean, we've had this conversation before. Mm-hmm. Tolkien is very dry. Right. You okay. know, I've, I, in fact, I have several copies of the book. I've never been able to get past the first chapter. <laughs> and I keep trying to force myself, but it's just like, I can't, I can't, I just can't. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I was excited to see the movies because, you know, everybody's talked about them. And once again, it was me and Jennifer. We were at the movie theater. They hang out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember it was the first one. And I, you know, the most experience I've had with, Tolkien was the cartoon. You remember yeah, the cartoon? The, the Ralph Bakshi. Right. Yes. So, you know, I do have a love for Lord of the Rings. I just haven't been able to read the books. Right. Gotcha. So just seeing it in real, you know, real life on the screen was just like fantastic. Uh-huh. Now, that was a great movie experience. The second movie experience was for the sequel. Me and Jennifer went, had to have been a matinee because the theater was empty right we sat directly in the middle of the theater perfect sweet spot exactly a couple of minutes later you know as the previews are rolling 
these teenagers come in. <laughs> Shit, darn teenagers! They sit Get out exactly, of my <laughs> exactly behind us. Right. Like, not a few seats rows back. I'm talking about right behind us. And I'm uh-huh. like, really? Because these were obnoxious teenagers because they talked almost all the way through it. I'm like, yeah. wow, you've got to be kidding me. Out of all the places you could have sat, uh-huh. you had to sit directly behind us. Had you maybe issued them a school ID and they weren't happy with their experience? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> but yeah, that was a mixed blessing. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Those are, those are some good films, though. I did enjoy them. Yeah. I didn't see them in the theater. Shame on me. Really? Yeah, but I can actually remember, like you're saying, watching the cartoons when I was in grade school. Mm-hmm. They would play them. And I think Hobbit was actually one of the ones that That's what watched. it was, The Hobbit. Yeah, yeah they yeah. did The Hobbit. It is the back she animated. Mm-hmm. Didn't that have Leonard Nimoy? As I think he was a voice on that. I don't know, but he, of course that could have been what spawned the Bilbo Baggins song. It's so uh, prevalent with Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but now it makes me think. Let's go have some second lunch. What do y'all think? <laughs> I uh, having been a fan of the books, uh, the movies were fantastic because uh, I did read the kid the, the books as a kid mm-hmm. uh, repeatedly as a kid, and the first time. So I remember my aha moment in. The Fellowship of the Ring is as they leave Rivendell the first time. I mean, the shots inside of uh, Bilbo's house at Bag End <laughs> with Gandalf bumping the roof and everything else. Those were amazing shots. But as they're cresting one of the mountains, the, the camera pans and you have Gandalf being taller and, and, and the dwarf being smaller, Gimli and Aragorn. And, and there's such an apparent difference in their heights. I was like fascinated by how well he had shot those scenes yeah. because you didn't see CGI or, or, or practical effects Tom Fuller. It just looked like you had dwarf and an elf oh, and the elf yeah. was walking across the snow and it was just amazing to see the visualization of it. And yeah, they did a great job with the movies. They did. I enjoyed them. Uh, I'm actually in the middle of the road between you guys. I never read the books uh, so I wasn't a huge fan and I didn't see it when it came out in the theaters. But when they came out on DVD... I did sit down, and, and Tina and I actually watched them, and very much enjoyed them. I was more of a um, sci-fi reader, so I didn't get too much into the fantasy, yeah. uh, except for some Piers Anthony stuff, uh, the Xanth novels and the Incarnates of Immortality. Oh, I, I lo- I've read those that series oh, over and over. So that would make such a great Netflix series. It would. You know, and he's got, I think, last count, 18 or so novels, so there's... Plenty of source material. Which ones? The Zank novels? Zank. Oh, yeah. oh, oh the, no. I think about the Incarnation. Oh, the Incarnations is good, too. I, mean, I think there were five of those. Seven. Seven. Yeah. Oh, good. I must he, have missed the last ones. He came back and wrote one, book six for the devil, uh-huh. and wrote seven for God. Oh, yes. wow. Seven is atrocious. It is. Six, it is. Uh, I would say two-thirds of the six was just retelling of the first five <laughs> but from the devil's perspective which that's, does that's add right. a little bit yeah, but yeah. didn't feel like there was a lot of creativity there uh, okay. um, but yeah those those were good I, I like the Incarnations uh, series maybe uh, maybe Piers Anthony needed a new Cadillac uh, a la <laughs> <laughs> Betsy Palmer <laughs> so that's a, that's a kickback to our, to our camp horror podcast so speaking of uh, books converted into movies that or resulted in a bad experience. Uh, growing up, I was a huge fan of the Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's mm, Guide. Yes. Ah, yes. Um, and the relatively recent movie that came out with uh, uh, Martin Freeman as mm-hmm. Arthur was a big disappointment for me. It was. And I know that they said that Douglas Adams was involved in the writing, but they changed so much. And yes, I understand that every iteration of the Hitchhikers has been different, this one just seemed... It's, I was very disappointed with the movie. I was looking so forward to that and being successful so they would launch more. Right. You know, but... To me, it seemed like there was a lot... There was a probably an executive, Hollywood executive, interfering with it. Yeah. But that was disappointing for me being such a big fan of the book. Right. You know? And that was another one of the these bad experiences. <laughs> well, I have an experience that it's not necessarily good or bad, but I just found that it was it was singularly unique. So Tina and I had gone to see Grindhouse, the movies by Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez. So we sat through Planet Terror, which was a really enjoyable zombie film. Um, 
I, I like the way that it kind of has the grindhouse missing reel scene in it and you know it gave you this really cool feel to it you know so then the intermissions came and so we're sitting there like oh this is neat you know just like the old days we could go grab something to you know and then um the death proof comes in which i'm sure you guys know i worship at the altar of, King, of kurt russell i thought this was amazing performances that he did so we go through the first part of the movie and uh you know he, with with everything that happens there and then now he's following the new set of girls and there's the whole scene where they they're picking each other up and then they go to eat at the restaurant and I'm watching this, and then all of a sudden you get this whole blur, blur, with the, the the celluloid like it's burned through. And we're thinking, oh man, this is kind of cool actually. And then all of a sudden the smoke alarm goes off. <laughs> and you get to, arr, 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 and we're like, wait, wait a minute, is, is this part of the movie or what? And actually there was something went wrong with the projection. It burned part of the uh, film, which set off the smoke alarm in the production room, which set off the fire alarm in the theater. So we had to go out, wait for it to clear out, and then came back in. And, by the way, we were the only two people in the theater. (laughs) Wow. You know, that reminds me of a story, another theater story. Um, So... When we did these screenings of the movies, quite often, if it was one that we want, all wanted to watch, there was one person who was paid to screen it, but we'd have a whole bunch of other employees in there. I've actually been to a few of those back in the day. So this was like, you know, Thursday night, one or two o'clock in the morning, everything's closed down, all the patrons are gone, popcorn machines all shut down, but we just stuck around because we want to see this movie. Do you have the big, huge garbage bag full of popcorn? No, we generally didn't because most of us were sick of popcorn. Most oh, of us okay. were, eat, were eating it all day long. Anyways, <laughs> so we're watching a movie, and I'm trying to remember the title. It was one of Christian Bale's early movies where they're digging in the... It's not too distant future, and they dig up, like, dragon eggs, and they, they end up taking over the world, and we kind of fight against them. Oh, Reign of Fire. Reign of yes, Fire. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Yes. With Sadiq Al-Fadil from so, PS9. We're all sitting down, the projection turns the lights off, and we're like, yay, movie's about to start, and the, the like, the first name, you know, the on the opening credits, the first name appears, and then, like, starting from the middle, it, like, burns away, we're like, oh, that's a cool effect. That's so awesome. <laughs> and we're all sitting there just kind of chatting, chatting, and we realize, wait, the screen's not going back, we're still <laughs> seeing all the credits, and the film had gotten stuck, and it burned, and we just, none of us moved, because we thought, oh, yeah, if I made it, goes <laughs> along with the movie, we thought, oh, it's a great fade effect, <laughs> turns out we ruined the print. It's almost like you couldn't plan that stuff. <laughs> yeah, so, when you said that, it reminded me of that story. That's a good one. <laughs> All right, Super Gus, it's your turn. Pass the baton. Okay. Another favorite movie experience is basically, I'm basing this on the entire series except for one movie. Okay. And that's Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. You guys love Harry Potter. Now, you tee that uh, Jennifer mm-hmm. all going to. Now, I, as I've stated before, my main genre is science fiction. Mm-hmm. But I also love Harry Potter. Uh, just about every showing that we've gone to for Harry Potter, it's just it's just been you know great, magical, and they yes. always seem used to hit around Tina's birthday. Yes, yeah, but no, it's just just people in costume or you know having whatever on trying to. And like, you never know; it might not be a costume. They could wear that all week long. <laughs> but uh, they've always been magical experiences, except for one. There was one Harry Potter movie. I forget it's it was either the third or the fourth movie. Me and Jennifer had gotten there late. Okay. So basically, we sat at the very front of the movie theater. Yeah. Okay. With you looking up. Exactly. And, you know, we're right at the front. The The screen is huge. Mm-hmm. So basically, you know, when they were changing scenes, I'm like looking back and forth mm-hmm. trying to take in the entire scene. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yes, Harry Potter, both my favorite memories. And one bad memory. What a pain in the neck. Oh, and it was. <laughs> I think I went back to go see it again. From, just, in fact, I did. Yeah. Uh, just to see if all, you know, to get the um, whole effect of the screen. Right, right. But, oh, yeah. that's funny. That's <laughs> funny. So, speaking of favorite memories, this was like the one that came to mind immediately when Jamie broached us about this subject. 
It really spans more than one, and you'll understand that here in a moment. But my son is turning 20 in January. Uh, or for those of you who are listening to this on some other date, two months from now, he'll be turning 20. <laughs> um, or for those who are going back to the archives, this will be January? Uh, January of 2020. He will be 20 years old. Um, when he was eight, we went together and saw a little almost borderline indie film that nobody thought was going to do anything called Iron Man. <laughs> not familiar with it. And uh, Was this like a biography of the Tin Man from Wizard yeah, of Oz? I think that, that might have been it. Yeah, yeah they, they painted him gold, though. But oh, yeah. Man. <laughs> and subsequently, over the last, last 12 years, we've gone and seen together son and, a father and son every Marvel movie released including all the Avengers movies, all the way up until uh, the Avengers Endgame, uh, all 23 movies. We missed one because he was out of town and uh, with his uh, mother at the time. But we saw every single one of those together, first showing together. And when, in fact, when Infinity War came out, he was uh, he was staying with his mother. And he waited like seven months until we were back together to oh. see it so that we could see it together. That's awesome. And when everything wrapped up at Endgame, it was just it was just a final... <laughs> the whole 10-year, 12-year span has been an amazing experience because I got to share this with my son. Yes. You know, and it, that's that's always been... That's building great memories. It is. It, really it is. is. <laughs> and let me, let, me, let me ride on that coattail for a minute and, and tell you... I can remember in 1977 going to see a little movie called Star Wars. Don't get me started, because that was my <laughs> next one. <laughs> and it was a great experience. It was my father, my brother, and I. I'm not sure why my mom didn't go, probably because it was a sci-fi film, and she just let the boys go. And, of course, you can say everything you want to say about how that movie affected us. You can't really ever recreate that experience, no. you know, with the internet and with with the way that things are just, you know, it's it's you can never rehab that experience because when you walked out of that movie theater, there was no going to the internet and checking what <laughs> Easter eggs you missed or or, or you know any of the, no tweeting to your friends. Hey, guess mm-hmm. what I just did? So it was the three of us, and I still remember my dad had a little yellow Volkswagen, and when we left that theater. We got into the car and we were driving back to Ball, and he started flashing the lights and making the pew 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 pew, pew sounds <laughs> like we were Lou headed back toward the, that star. And um, I'm telling you, Michael is going to remember that for the rest of his life. And that's a that's a great thing that you that you not only gave him but you gave yourself. I hope so. Yeah, I think it is. Although I'd like to point out to your listeners at this point that you two are older than I am because <laughs> I was not old enough. I did not see Star Wars even here. I would have been three. Hush your mouth. <laughs> but, you know, on the same coattails of that, I remember it was me, my brother, and my mother. We were in the um, theater and just the opening shot with Tantu, Tantu, yeah, That's Tantu right. 4 mm-hmm. just flying down the screen followed by oh, the yeah. star, the, um, Star Destroyer. Star Destroyer. It was, yeah, yeah. It was just, it was mind-boggling. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, because before that, no science fiction show or movie, TV show, whatever, had gone to, they had that much detail. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just... Wait, are you saying War of the Satellites is not as detailed as Star Wars A New Hope? I, I, I can't believe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was just, it was just something mind-blowing. Yeah, yeah. I will never forget that. I, I just, agree with you. That that scene is imprinted in your... In, exactly. In your very ingrained because there was nothing like that. No. Yeah. I mean, what what came before that, that was even remotely? I can, I'm, honestly, I can't even, even think of a movie that that had that type of impact on us. Not that type of impact. I, I mean, really, if you, if you look at the history of it, Star Wars was the first of its kind because science fiction prior to that were, was like lost in space, right. black Can't hole, uh, and they didn't have the, the, the special effects. It was just guys in costumes on right. a quote-unquote space station. Well, uh, it was an opera. I mean, it was. It, it was so sweeping and with all the different planets and all the mythology behind it. And it's hard to think, imagine that something being created and having that same feeling. Well, it's think- totally another different uh, podcast. But it's amazing to me how quickly and how established 
that universe came mm-hmm. to the viewers when they were watching. The, I mean, you didn't question the Galactic <laughs> Empire. You didn't question, you know, how are they traveling? You just just got engrossed from moment one, right? And was like, oh wow, Luke is a, a nerf herder on a sand planet and having to <laughs> deal with moisture farm, and you just automatically assume. I mean, how does moisture farming even work? <laughs> now that I'm older, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I can't. You can't re- erase the, the magic of that movie. Right, you know? right. And now you would want those answers. And exactly, you'd go out and exactly. you'd Google it or you'd you know, go onto a, a board or something. Mm-hmm. Or t- 10 to 1, somebody had already figured it out and it was on YouTube. <laughs> but back then, all we had were us talking about it. Sure, there were some some magazines, maybe a, a Starlog uh, might have had one or there might have been a you know, a, a, a monthly something, but there was no instant gratification. So we just didn't even feel that we did. We just accepted it. Right. You know, it was, it was part of us. And then we just waited for the toys to come out. Exactly. And I had a lot <laughs> of them. Yeah. Oh my God. Every holiday, every Christmas, every birthday, Star Wars, Star Wars, <laughs> Star Wars, you know, that's played a significant role in my life. Yes. It's been, I mean, it's really part, it's, uh, it is part of all of our lives. Right. You know, and if you, if you don't know that, then you weren't born in that generation. Exactly. I'm not going to say that it started my love of sci-fi, because if um, oh, it fueled it, I'm sure. Right. No, what started it was Star Trek, the original mm-hmm. series. So, do you think you saw Star Trek, the original series, before you went to see Star Wars in the theater, or do you mean that it was just there in your experience, but it didn't? Isn't, when did the original series air? Well, it, it aired in the 60s. I was about to say it. Okay, but it was in syndication. Right. So no, I, I, I watched it in syndication. Before you went and saw Star yes. Wars. Okay. Because okay. My, both my mother and father surprised... You know, they, neither of them ever struck me as sci-fi, science fiction fans. Mm-hmm. But whenever Star Trek would come on, they would watch it. Yeah. So that's how come, you know, I grew up with it. Right. It's right. interesting. That and Doctor Who. Yeah, see Doctor Who. And I'm talking I, about the original Doctor Who. Uh, so on that subject, who is your doctor? If Tom you, Baker. Tom Baker. Say, you, you, we all grew up in that time period. <laughs> yeah. Same time period. Now, sure, there may be better performances now. I don't. I don't. You know, I don't want to get into that. But, but this, Tom Baker's my doctor. Tom, his era. Oh my God. It, before that, before Tom Baker was kind of light. Mm-hmm. You know, Tom Baker. His era took it to a darker place. Yeah. But at the same time, it also took it to a lighter, sillier place because no doctor prior to Tom Baker had offered villains juju piece. <laughs> <laughs> and the Tom Bakers, when they also introduced K nine, yes, right. Um, so there, there's a lot, a lot of levity during Tom Baker's time period. True, but yeah, some of us. I didn't realize you guys were Doctor Who fans. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But again, just from that kind of from that era, right? I, I haven't kept up with it very well. I haven't either. I've watched the first season. Um, when it came back, yeah, Christopher Eccleston, correct. His now there's a was, lady doctor. Yes. Yeah, but, and I don't mean the, the gynecologist who. <laughs> I mean a lady doctor a who, female doctor. Yes. yes. I did not. I, I hate to say this, but I didn't enjoy his presentation of the doctor. It did. He seemed almost anti-doctor from what I was used to, and I've I've seen like the old old original Doctor Who, the so, very first ones. I think that. The concept of Doctor Who is brilliant because they can continually change not only the actor, but the personalities, the writer, everything. Because every right. doctor does have his own personality. And that's why it's lasted so long. I will say that Christopher Eccleston's uh, season, in my opinion, was not the best. I uh, agree with you. But if you could make it through another seven or eight seasons mm-hmm. to the 50th anniversary special... They do actually give a justification as to why his doctor was a little bit more... Um, mean? Yeah, a little, a, little, <laughs> a little hardened, yeah. And at some point off radio, we'll, we'll go over that, because I actually had the 50th anniversary on the computer. Oh. And it's interesting to watch, because they had guest appearances. Number one, John Hurt's in it. Really? Uh, Harkening back to a, a previous podcast that we had done. <laughs> um, and I almost don't want to ruin it, but at the very, very end... Tom Baker shows up. Oh, yes. wow. And it's, I've heard of this. It's the most amazing thing I think I've ever seen. It's like, I was, as a fanboy, I was just just totally enthralled because he's still very much, like, Tom Baker, I would say, almost breaks the fourth wall during his tenure as Doctor Who. Yeah. He, he, he panders to the audience a little bit, but in this particular appearance, he 
he knows. It's like you just get this feeling of knowing, and it's just it's just a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful send off for, for for Tom Baker. You know, as same thing as my doctor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Beyond that, you you might enjoy some of the t- David Tennant ones. The David Tennant ones are probably some of the best of the newer ones. Right. Uh, although none of them do a bad job. You know, a, a lot of it's just a matter of writing. But the, the, you guys should see some of the new Doctor Who. Some of them are not bad. I, I keep telling myself eventually I'll get around to them. Well, I think that Lowe should uh, cook us some, something to eat and invite us over to watch. <laughs> to be honest, it doesn't matter what we watch as long as he's cooked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this has been great. Um, oh. I almost think we need to... T- I think we need to do maybe one more each. Okay. And... Um, Lowe's just got his, and so why don't you do one more, Gus? Okay. And then I've got one last story, and we'll call it a day. All right. Most favorite movie experience. Okay. Once again, it was with your wife, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a little worried about this. These listeners are going to get a little bit of the wrong idea. <laughs> it was Thanksgiving, and this was before you guys were married, so... Uh, we went to go see The Others with Nicole Kidman. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So because this would have been before I even knew you people. Oh, way before. Yeah. We yeah, went Gus to- was young back then. <laughs> yeah, not by much, but we went to the theaters totally empty. It was literally just me and Jennifer in the middle of the theater just watching this movie. Now, I've always been a Nicole Kidman fan. Right. Ever since um, To Die For, I believe. Oh, okay. For you know, for the audience who have, haven't seen it, it's basically a ghost story. So there were some creepy moments in it. And it was just, you know, ramped up because we were the only two in there. <laughs> so we didn't have the comfort of knowing, you know, there's somebody by us who could, right. like, you know, do something if one of us have a heart attack or die of fright or something. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just a great movie experience. That's and, awesome. You know, I, whenever I think of good experiences, I always go to that one. That's a good one. Just so you know. She probably shares that opinion mm-hmm. because early into our dating, uh, she actually made me sit and watch the movie <laughs> and she said, oh, this is a great movie, great movie. We sat there and watched it and she said, oh, it must have been better when I watched it the first time because she didn't care for the movie as much the second time. So I'm sure you made a lasting impression as well. <laughs> well, I've never watched it afterwards, but just, you know, in the, in the moment, it was a great movie. That's awesome. Well, I've got to say... My favorite experience has got to have been the Star Wars experience, but my second favorite also has to do with my family. I have I have a lot of uh, memories from my family because my dad did a lot of the genealogy, mm-hmm. so we were you know we were always really uh, ever present about who was you know in our family who our you know progenitors were. But we went to go see Buck Rogers in the 25th century. You remember when it had a three, theatrical release yes. and it actually had yes. a theme song with music in it and stuff? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, don't, you can, don't yeah. look on Lowe's face. He has no <laughs> idea what I'm talking I, about. I saw it in syndication on TV. Yeah, yeah. So originally, the first two-part episode of Buck Rogers was a theatrically released movie. Mm-hmm. And I can't even remember if they had the original opening. But the original opening has um, Aaron Gray. <gasps> yes. And a couple of maybe other ladies doing this kind of rolling around dancing thing to the Buck Rogers song, which I'm going to add here at the end of this podcast, (laughs) a snippet at least. Um, But anyway, it was a great movie. You know, um, I had, I knew who Buck Rogers was. Uh, I'd read the, the, the comic strips, you know, as a kid from the papers. Um, but the, the movie itself was was quite enjoyable. And it did kick off for me um, a love of sci-fi. Because where a lot of people had Star Trek figures or Star Wars figures, I had Buck Rogers in the 25th century figures. I had the, 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 the ships, I had all of that stuff. Um, But when we went to see the movie and when we left, we we saw it at at, at a single uh, screen place. It was in Alexandria. It's long gone. But it was a beautiful theater with uh, the, the, the velvet hanging from all the different areas. It actually still had an orchestra pit in it that was roped off. It had a balcony. It was just, it was a beautiful throwback to, to what theaters used to be. And um, as we were leaving, I was telling my dad how cool this place was. 
And he said, you know, actually, he says, it's the, well, this, is, this place is one of the whole reasons why you and I are both here. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, back way before I was even born, your grandmother was a ticket girl, which is someone who, when you would come up, you would actually buy a ticket, and they would push a little machine, it would come out, and she'd and give it to whoever's coming in. And she met your grandfather, who was an usher here. And they started dating and eventually, of course, got married. And here we are. <laughs> and I'll, that always, every time I drove by that, or every time I rode by that place, every, I couldn't stop thinking about the fact of seeing my grandmother and my grandfather <laughs> in what must have been those cool little uniforms with him with his big flashlight and her with her roll of tickets. Uh, and that's, you know, that's where it all happened. So that's probably one of my favorite things. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's fantastic. Yes, yes. So, all right. Well, I think we will end it there. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. It I really was, enjoyed this. It was. You know, and uh, I think maybe we'll have to do something like this again where we don't really have a, a set list. We just, we just shoot the breeze, <laughs> as Phantom Dark Day would say. <laughs> So thanks a lot. I appreciate you both being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for having me. To all you listeners out there, thank you for once again joining us for Fave 5 from Fans. Be sure to stick around and watch for us. Uh, Every two weeks we'll have a new episode. And we may be dropping stuff here and there. So make sure to check our feed, save it, and uh, come back as often as you like. This is Hulk Boy from Hollywood signing off. Something I dream